Hello, do you have a bad memory? Do you drive all the way into work only to get there and find out that you forgot to bring something? Well, let me show you how I solved that problem. Build yourself an electronic checklist. Not only will this prevent you from forgetting things, it will also add fun and colorful lights to your commute. You ought to see all the green and red lights in the middle of the night. Okay, here's how it works. Okay, the way this checklist works, get in the truck, I'm about ready to go to work. This side here is when you're going to work. This side here is for when you want to go home. See? So you just hit the main power switch. The lights come on. If it's red, that means you have not accomplished that checklist item. If it's green, that means you have accomplished it. So you can tell it's still set up from the last time I went home. So I'm headed into wet work. I need my badge. I've got it in my hand. You throw the switch. When you throw the switch for your badge, it sets up the checklist for going home. You'll notice the going home badge checklist is now red. Okay, I check. I've got my Palm Pilot. Oh, don't have my wallet, but I do have my phone. I have my pouch. And I left extra stuff in here because, you know, you always forget stuff when you're designing. So you can see that I've added two other things since I've come up with this design. I happen to have all those. Now I'll go out and see if I can find my wallet. Okay, now I found it. I can throw it. I've got greens all the way down. It's time to go to work. Turn the checklist off and you can go to work and you will not forget anything. Going home, same way. You've got your badge, Palm Pilot, a jacket. Did you leave a jacket at work? Sunglasses, etc., etc. Now that we've seen the checklist in action, let's talk about the design process. This was actually two separate projects. The first project is building some sort of housing to store the checklist in. It has to be uh, versatile and be able to move from vehicle to vehicle. The second project is actually building the electronic checklist. This would include the LEDs, the switches, the resistors, the power supply, and all the other stuff that's associated with it. Since most vehicles nowadays have very little room to add your own custom parts, I was forced to look for a characteristic of the interior of a vehicle, either a car or a truck, that would be common to all vehicles. The solution? The ever-present cup holder. I don't believe they make a car nowadays that doesn't have one in it. Now that I have a location selected, I could figure out how much real estate I need on the face of my checklist. All of the operational components had to be mounted on this face. That included the LEDs, the switches, and the decals. An additional factor that needs to be considered is most LEDs aren't designed to be looked at from the side. You pretty much have to be looking straight down on them or pretty close to straight down on them to see them as bright as they can be. So the checklist has to be angled so that you can see it while you're sitting in the driver's seat. And you can also read the decals that you're going to be placing later on. Notice the bottom of the checklist is small. That's small enough to fit into your cup holder. Then it gradually gets bigger to expand out, so it's a nice tight fit when it goes into the cup holder. The reason why you want a tight fit is because you don't want the checklist to move when you throw the switch. Not only is the front and the back angled, but the sides are angled as well. The back of the box is considerably higher than the front. This is what gives us our angle when we want to view the checklist. If you're a woodworker looking at this box, you're probably saying to yourself, this would be a nightmare to build. There's no square angles, and there's lots and lots of angles. The truth is, yes, it was quite a nightmare to build this box. Since I didn't want to use any metal mounting hardware because there's electricity involved, you can see the lid on the right-hand side has little wood furring strips. I exactly position them so that when you put the lid on the box, it makes it for a very tight friction fit and holds the lid in place. All electronics produce heat, so I put ventilation holes in all around the top. And as you can see, the holes go all the way around the top of the box. And it also provides a convenient place to feed your power cord that you're going to be plugging into your truck or your car. Finish the box off with a coat of black paint and a couple coats of polyurethane. And you can't even tell it used to be wood. Okay, let's talk about some electronics. As you can see from the pictures, the circuit is so simple and basic, I didn't even bother drawing a schematic diagram when I built it. 
If you know how to solder, anyone can put this circuit together. After I decided to post this video, I went ahead and drew up a schematic diagram so I could explain the circuit to people. So in all its simplicity, here it is. When you look at the whole thing all at once, it looks like quite a forest. But let's take a look at the individual trees and zoom in and look at each component. Here's our power source. It's your standard plug that goes into your cigarette lighter. Of course, it's got a fuse built into it. You always want to protect your electronics. From the power supply, the electricity flows up to the main power switch. This is a single pole, single throw switch. Now switches can be a little complicated, so I'll talk more about those later. When the on-off switch is closed, the electricity is sent up to two separate on-off LEDs. These LEDs will light up green, indicating that you have good circuit power. I use two power on LEDs instead of one, so that I could keep the symmetry of the checklist looking good. And because we have two on LEDs, the number of LEDs down both sides of the switches are equal. And therefore we have symmetry. Or in Latin terms, it looks good. Or gooder. Or bestus. Uh, now back to the schematic. Let me explain the purpose for that 330 ohm resistor in the circuit. This is the schematic symbol for an LED. LED stands for light emitting diode. An LED is a semiconductor device. In English this means that it will not be conducting unless a preset amount of voltage is applied across the terminals. It normally acts as an open switch. But if you supply sufficient voltage, approximately 1.6 to 6 volts, depending on the color of the LED, and that voltage is more negative on the pointed side than on the flat side, then the LED will start conducting electricity. The flowing electricity will create two byproducts, heat and light. This diagram shows the correct way to hook up a battery to cause an LED to turn on. Once the LED is turned on, here's where we run into our problem. So much current will flow through that LED that it will burn it up. We can fix this problem by installing a current limiting resistor. This resistor will drop the voltage of the circuit down, it will slow the electricity down, and it will also produce heat. So since everything we've talked about produces heat, I'll take you back to the picture showing all those ventilation holes we talked about earlier. Now we need to figure out the size of that resistor. I hate to say it since it's a four letter word, but we figure out the size by using math. Here's a quick look at the worksheet I used for calculating the resistor value. All of the equations are all very easy to use, consisting of only three variables each. In the upper right hand corner we draw the circuit. The top component will be the LED, the right side is the resistor, and the bottom is your power supply going in. We'll let the letter V stand for our voltages. And now we can start looking up data. Every electronic component has a data sheet, and this data sheet will tell you pertinent information about the component. I now know that the particular LED I'm using drops 2.5 volts DC across it. Go back over to my schematic and I fill in 2.5 volts for V1. And I know that the VT in my power supply is 12 volts DC. What we don't know is what voltage will the resistor drop. And believe it or not, there's a formula that can tell us that. There was a fine fellow named Kirchhoff that made a law. This law said the sum of the voltages dropped in a circuit must equal the voltage put into the circuit. We fill in our known values and we solve for V2. And we get 9.5 volts. We'll be dropped across our resistor. To figure out the value of my resistor, I need at least two pieces of data. I already have the voltage dropped, so let's look up the current that's going to be flowing across it. The data sheet says that this LED is rated at 0.03 amps. This means less current than that, the LED will be dimmer, more current than this, might destroy the LED. Once again, now I have two pieces of data. I can plug that into this formula, and it will tell me what size resistor will allow that much current to flow. 316 ohms was the answer. When they manufacture resistors, they manufacture them in preset values. 316 ohms is not one of them. So I go to the next standard size up resistor. And in case you're wondering, I went up instead of down. Because if I go up, I'll get less current flow. If I go down, I'll get more current flow. So I'd rather have a dimmer light than one that's blown out. Less current flow is better. Let's plug our new piece of information into our schematic. Now I need to calculate how much power that resistor is going to have to dissipate. Simplified, what this means is how hot is it going to get. I go back over to Ohm's Law again. 
I plug in my 330 ohm resistor, dropping 9.5 volts. I now know the real circuit current will be 0 0.028 amps. Plug it into the schematic. Now that I know current and voltage, two pieces of information, you guessed it, let's pull up another formula. Power is equal to current times voltage, and I find I'm dropping 0.266 watts. Resistors are built with standard wattage ratings, for example, 1 8, 1 quarter, and 1 half. 1 quarter watt is the closest to the uh, requirements I have, so that's what I'll use. As a real quick note, you would normally pick the uh, next higher value wattage resistor, but this wattage is for a full duty cycle, while my checklist will only be on for a couple minutes at a time. As we finish panning back out, you can see how simple this worksheet really was. A quick note of clarification. There are two schools of thought on how to represent voltage. Some use a V, like in the top equation, and the other uses an E, as in the bottom equation. Since I went to both schools, I use both interchangeably. I hope I didn't provide confusion for anybody. Let's look at the actual resistors. The small resistor on the right is the 1 quarter watt resistors that we calculated. The larger resistor on the left is actually a 1 half watt resistor. They're both 330 ohm resistors, identified by the orange-orange-brown markings on it. But the larger resistor has more surface area, therefore it can dissipate more heat. And that's what makes it a half watt versus a quarter watt. I threw the half watts in there because I ran out of quarter watters. Let's head back to our original schematic. Most circuits have a lot of wires which are all common to each other. Or their sole purpose in the schematic is simply to complete the circuit returning back to the power source. Because those wires don't have any components on them, such as the green wire shown here, a way to simplify wiring diagrams has been created. That method is called the ground. As you can see, the wire that was green is now replaced with this little ground symbol. The ground symbol is attached to the battery, and every place in the circuit where there's a ground symbol means that wire goes straight back to the battery. This convention can significantly reduce the number of wires on a diagram, making it much easier to read. The LEDs I used on my checklist are special. They have three leads instead of the standard two. Electrically speaking, this is what it looks like. The center lead is a common point back to the power source, and it has a red LED and a green LED. You hook up the resistors we calculated earlier to each of the LED legs, as shown. Then when you apply power through the battery, this is what it looks like. Both LEDs will come on at the same time. Now let me show you a really bad idea. With only one LED installed, moving the resistor to the other side would actually work and not harm the circuit. But look what happens when both LEDs are turned on. Current flowing through your current limiting resistor is actually doubled. Remember, we calculated it out for just one LED, not two. Because of that, your resistor probably won't be able to handle the power flowing through it. So let's put the resistors back where they belong. We're almost there. Now let's add some switches to this circuit. Unfortunately, I think I need to say something about switches. There really doesn't seem to be any kind of industry standard in describing switches. So ordering switches off the internet is pretty much a hit or miss ordeal. Here we have the simplest of all switches. It's either on or off. You'll often see this listed as SPST as shown. This means it's a single pole or one input circuit single throw or one output circuit. I use this for my power switch. It's either on or it's off. Instead of SPST, some companies will simply label it on-off as shown. Other companies may say on-none-off, saying either the switch is on or it's in no position or it's off. The switch I actually use for the checklist is an SPDT. That's still single pole or one input but now it's a double throw or two possible outputs. This will pass power from a common source to one of two possible circuits, like maybe a red or a green light. You may find this labeled on on or on none on, but don't fall into this trap. See the word on has brackets around it? This normally means that the switch is spring loaded and it's only momentarily held in that position. When you release it, it goes back to the off or middle position. I've only uh, touched on the problem with switches, but we'll ignore the rest of it because I think we know enough to continue with the checklist. We need one single pole single toggle for the power, and six of these single pole double toggle switches for the actual checklist items.
To control if the LED is on or off, we can install two switches as shown. When we close the switch on the right hand side, the green LED will come on. The green in this diagram shows the current flow to light the LED. Now let's open the switch on the right and close the switch on the left. You can see by the pink line, current will flow up and through the red LED, causing it to come on. I'd like to replace the two switches with one switch to do the same function. That will be the single pole double throw switch we talked about earlier. With the switch in the right hand position, current will flow and light the green light. Move the switch to the left hand position and current will flow lighting the red light. As you can see, the switch will either cause a red or a green light to come on. What I want to do is make the switch turn a green light on on one side and a red light on on the other, and vice versa. Here you can see the circuit we just talked about. The switch is on the left hand side causing the red light to come on. Now I create an identical circuit without the switch and attach the green light to the same wire that drives the red light. This means anytime I turn on the red light on the right hand side, the green light on the left hand side will also come on. I do the same thing for when the switch is moved from the left to the right side. The end result is, no matter what position the switch is in, I always have a green light and a red light. Now I hope I've shown you the simplicity of this circuit. And here I've actually redrawn the circuit in our schematic. And then repeated the same circuit over and over again for each switch position. So as I've shown, this is actually very simple. Now that we're ready to hook up the wiring, let me tell you about another anomaly with switches. With an SPDT switch, the input circuit's normally in on the center. One would think if the switch is to the right, that the output would come out of the right-hand side. But alas, it's not. The output comes out of the opposite direction that the switch is pointed. So this diagram shows the reason why it comes out of the opposite side. The switch is solid all the way through with a pivot point in the middle. Move the switch to the left and you can see the output comes out of the right side. This is something to keep in mind when you're actually hooking up the wires to a switch. A weak point of the checklist will be the main power line coming in. You need to ensure that it is well anchored to prevent someone from catching their foot on it or something and ripping it out of the circuit. In my case I anchored it in two places, to the box and to the lid using hot glue. Color-coded solid core wiring made component-to-component -component connections a lot easier. Remember that ground symbol we talked about earlier where all wires return to the battery? The easiest way to build that is a plain bare wire. It connects every single LED's center contact to the return line to the battery. With this many wires in close proximity to each other, make sure that uh, any wire that has the possibility of coming in contact with other wires is insulated. And after a couple hours of careful soldering, here you have it, a completed checklist. Thanks for watching.